are recording. Thanks for having me, Matthew. Uh, good evening, everyone. So again, Jorge Bogantes with the Anacostia Watershed Society. Uh, my organization, the Anacostia Watershed Society, is based in Bladensburg, Maryland, but we do work in DC and, and Maryland portions of um, and, uh, uh, Prince George's County and Montgomery County. Um, so yeah, I will be talking about our mussel project. Um, why mussels? So we, uh, the Anacostia Watershed Society has been around since 1989. I'm going to interrupt uh, you just a second. I'm seeing yeah. you speaking instead of your slide presentation on my screen. And I want to make sure that's not just oh, yeah, me. Yeah. Um, I can see it. OK, good. Maybe it's just me then. Oh, there we are. That's better. All right, okay. carry on. All right. Uh, so yeah. So we've been doing a lot of field work, planting trees, uh, revegetating wetlands and whatnot. Um, but in recent years, we started um, in, uh, encountering uh, shells and mussels. So we started sort of paying mo more attention to mussels. We, we, bar we barely knew anything about mussels before that. Um, and and actually the one event that really triggered my interest uh, personally was i was fishing with, with one of our former uh, board members tony thomas it was uh, we were collecting fish tissues for the university of maryland for, for a, an analysis of, of pollutants and uh, anyways we uh, tony was reeling in his his, his uh, line and then at the end, end of it, or, or near the end, there was a mussel uh, that snagged onto it. And, and I, I knew it was a mussel, not a clam, just because of the shape, because I had taken the benthic macroinvertebrate class from the Maryland DNR, but I had no idea what species is what it was. So I shared it with the Maryland Biodiversity Project, which I highly recommend. You can see down there, marylandbiodiversity.com. And, um, and and yeah, it was identified by Matt Ashton, the Maryland DNR uh, mussel expert, who later uh, and still to this day has been a key person uh, helping us with this program. Um, and and well, the the mussel turned out to be an eastern floater, and it's a species that we're now propagating actually. Uh, and we were we did a lot of uh, uh, work with the uh, uh, Valisneria americana or wild celery, uh, planting uh, wild celery in in PVC cages in the lower Anacostia River. Uh, and during those years, we started seeing even more mussels there inside the cages, uh, from juveniles, as as you can see on the on the left side of the slide, to um, mussel adult mussels of all sizes. Uh, well, first, this is the question everyone asks: Can you eat them? Uh, well, yes and no. I mean, uh, technically, yes, they are edible, but you don't want to eat them from a waterway like the Anacostia River. And even if the Anacostia River was clean, they say they taste like mud. Uh, they are not like the marine mussels. So, so yeah, you don't want to eat them. And the and the other big reason, they are quite imperiled, as, as I will uh, talk in a minute. Uh, one of the reasons why we're doing it is because the Anacostia River is improving. You might have heard a lot of negative stuff about the Anacostia, and yes, it was in, in really bad shape, but in the last, uh, particularly the last decade, uh, there's been a lot of developments, one of which is the Clean Rivers Project by DC Water. Uh, they built a huge tunnel, 26 feet diameter, um, to capture sewage and storm water and direct it to the Blue Plains Water Treatment Plant, which many people don't know is the biggest advanced water treatment plant in the world. Uh, you would think in New York or Tokyo, but it's, it's, it's right here in, in DC. Uh, so it, it collects the, the 3 billion gallons of, of combined sewer overflow um, out of the Anacostia. So it actually exceeded expectation is, is in, in terms of the, the E. coli bacteria is uh, in, in, in sewage uh, 
is, is capturing uh, around 88% of sewage. Um, and not only that, all the trash that comes with the stormwater uh, in, in the order of 150 tons per year. Uh, another reason why we do this is because uh, we learned that some other people were doing it. Uh, the folks at the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary have been uh, doing a great muscle work um, led by uh, Danielle Krieger. She's a scientist and she's been doing a lot of uh, inter interesting research comparing marine bi bivalves with, the, with freshwater mussels. So a lot of good stuff. And they also work with the hatchery that we work with, which is the, the it's called the Virginia Fisheries and Aquatic Wildlife Center, or also the old name is Harrison Lake National Fish Hatchery. It used to be a fish hatchery turned into a mussel hatchery and is the biggest one in the region, uh, I would say mid-Atlantic at least, then south. Uh, and is run by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources. And they really made it possible because all the nitty gritty of mussel propagation goes on at this hatchery. And, and I'll talk more about that. Um, as you will see, this is, can be a complicated thing, propagating mussels. Uh, and, and then the, the really the big reason why we do this is because it's, it's more, it was more doable as the river is improving. We do the, we, we've been doing water quality monitoring for uh, almost a couple of decades now. And, uh, and the, the trend in the river is of improvement in different variables of water quality. Um, for example, water clarity and, uh, and dissolve oxygen. Um, one thing that's still kind of like question mark is the, the stormwater runoff volume being a highly urban and suburban area. Uh, and one thing that can be hit or miss is the acreage of submerged aquatic vegetation. And that's, that's what, this is the state of the river uh, for last year uh, uh, with a, a, a data analysis from 2021. And it failed mostly because we had less acreage of submerged aquatic vegetation, but the other variables are actually trending towards improvement. Uh, mussels are filter feeders. So these mussels can filter, uh, an adult freshwater mussel can filter between 10 and 20 gallons of water a day. And, and as filter feeders, they just filter whatever's suspended in whatever's in the water column and then they expel what they don't eat and assimilate what they find nutritious, which could be E. coli bacteria, uh, protozoans, uh, uh, aquatic fungi uh, spores, uh, plankton, uh, and different kinds, kinds of microorganisms. Actually, it's not known in detail what all the things that they eat. Uh, that's still a subject of, of research. But at least we know that they, they eat a lot of the plankton and um, and, and so that a lot of the commercial uh, they would use to feed mussels in aquaculture setting and at the hatchery they use uh, whatever they would use for marine uh, uh, mussels, similar species of, of planktonic algae. And then the perhaps the most fascinated aspect of this group of mussels the, in the Unionidae family is that they depend on fish to complete their life cycle. Now, all the pretty much all the bivalves don't need this. They just release the, the larva and the larva goes suspended in the water and whatever it lands, it starts growing. But these guys can't do that. They must rely on a fish. And what, what happens is, for example, in this case, this is the Eastern pond mussel. The female, uh, well, first the female will intercept the, the sperm that is in the water column, fertilize the eggs, and then the eggs will be in her gills. And then uh, the, the, once fertilized, they, they will then hatch and become the larva that we call glochidia. 
and then and and, and she uh, develops pouches in in the gills to to take care of the the larva. And this, uh, in the case of these species, is is is, is uh, several months. You know, the female might might uh, get fertilized in the let's say ar around now or the f later in the fall, and then the they will uh, she will release the the larva into the fish in the spring uh, so when she's ready to release the the larva when when whatever the the, the host fish gets uh, nearby she will release uh, the the larva and the larva will attach to the fish kind of this is like the creepy crawly stage and it's, uh, it's kind of like having lice or or, or ticks <laughs> it's, it's a parasitic relationship and and the, the larva will eat bodily fluids or tissues from the fish in that period of time, which can be three weeks or so. And then after that, uh, they drop down to the riverbed and become filter feeders as we know them. At that point, they are they are about the size of a grain of sand, so super tiny. And and then from there. If three months later, they might be of that size that you see here and like a fingernail and then they keep growing. Um, any questions so far? Because this is a, like the complex and, and cool part of their, their biology. So is, is each, uh, is it one species of fish? Does each mussel have its own particular species of fish? Yes, yeah, some, it varies. Some species are very specific. For example, in the uh, in the Clinch River, Virginia and Tennessee, and other areas like that, there might be species that depend on one darter species. You know, like the tiny darter fish. Um, and in general, in the Anacostia River, most of the species we have are generalists, um, so they they might go with different species. There's always one or two species or or one taxon of fish that works better. And, and by that I mean that there's more uh, metamorphosis into juvenile uh, and, and, and such. Uh, so, so, so yeah, it depends on on the species. So I, again, it might be a, it might they might be generalists or they might be specialists on one species or group of fish. Got it. And then in the chat, uh, there's a question: Does the mussel larva kill the fish? Uh, it can happen, but normally no. It's a it's a parasitic uh, relationship, so it's not a predatory relationship. Uh, so it it can happen, especially in the artificial setting, like at the hatchery. If, if let's say they put a lot of larva in the gills of uh, let's say a blue a young blue gill, yes, the fish might die. But I think in nature is 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 rare. And actually, they have. They actually have uh, tested this scientifically if, if this is really a parasitic relationship and they have, have used, you know, isotope technology to track nutrients from the mussel to the fish. And yes, they have confirmed that the larva do get nourishment from the fish. <clears throat> And, and yeah, so this is, and in the case of this Eastern pond mussel, uh, this is a white perch, but they can use largemouth bass. Actually, that's what they use a lot in the hatchery because largemouth bass is an easy fish to, to raise in, in the aquaculture setting. So they use bass for, for several species, uh, especially if they're generalists. Uh, th actually, this one has, uh, and, but I'm gonna show you, this one has, uh, even goes further they have mantle lures to attract the host fish and I, i'll explain that in a second in this case they do have a mantle lure but it's not as showy as as the next example i'm gonna show you this is an, an eastern lamb mussel one of the, the local species uh, here in the anacostia watershed and they what they do is the female has a specialized tissue in the mantle that looks like a minnow, like a fake minnow. So when she's ready to release the larva, she will wiggle that minnow and look uh, look at the here. It even has a fake eye and sort of a tail and fin-like uh, little threads right there. So she will wiggle it and then when and that will attract the fish and then the fish will bite 
and then she will release the larva into the fish. So that's one of the coolest things. Uh, and then uh, other species, what they might do is they release a conglutinate. That's like a sack of larva. And sometimes it's really fascinating. The conglutinate might be the shape of a fish of, or a crayfish. So really amazing adaptations uh, of these mussels. Uh, well, some other organisms that we have started learning about as the, the freshwater sponges, and um, they are also filter feeders, and almost nothing is not known about them. I, I, I finally found an expert from Michigan, uh, because almost nobody works on this uh, taxon, um, <clears throat> and uh, we found this one in in the upper Anacostia watershed, the, the green one, because they, they have symbiotic algae. But the relationship with mussels, I guess, here is that uh, we found that this one in the middle, this is an eastern elliptio that was coated with uh, a freshwater sponge. And this was from Bosser Point, the lower Anacostia River. And, and then on the right, this other one uh, was growing on one of our mussel uh, culturing baskets, one of the floating baskets. Uh, So basically, I would say our journey with mussel conservation started in 2015, actually with Matt Ashton. He's the, the, the Maryland DNR mussel expert. And uh, we, at that time, we basically uh, contracted the DNR as a consultant to help us do an assessment of mussels in the Anacostia River, in the tidal Anacostia River. Uh, not only in Maryland, but also on the DC portion of the river. And, 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 and they did that and we found like six uh, species. And then later on with our surveys, uh, we found a couple others. Uh, and so after the DNR assessment, which was the first of its kind for the Anacostia River, we started doing our own surveys and we do them to, to this day with volunteers. It's, it's pretty much a community or citizen science effort. Uh, and basically, we, this is a qualitative survey to give us an indirect measure of the relative abundance of the species at different sites. And, and we can see trends in mussel numbers over time. And, and now it's especially nice because we, we find our propagated mussels, the ones that are tagged at least, and I'll explain that later, but we, when we find a tag mussel, we know how much it has grown and survival and such. If we find, find the dead and such. So, so it is uh, basically we're monitoring the, the mussel community. In the, yeah. We use a form like this to capture data on length and other different things and water quality as well. Um, the thing about mussels is the detectability. Uh, well, it's kind of like fishing. <laughs> if you think about it, one one day you go zero, the next day you might find a lot. Uh, so so, and 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 it depends on different things, uh, microhabitat conditions, temperatures, tide, uh, and many things that are still not even that well known because the the tide water, the, the tidal fresh water is not as studied as, let's say, non-tidal streams. Like, uh, there's a lot of research from places like Virginia and mostly in the, the mountains uh, or, or more, more in the valleys in, in, the, in the western area, uh, but not so much information on to recently from these tide waters. And, and again, remember that these are this is uh, this is the Anacostia River is tidal, but it is a freshwater system. These mussels only occur in freshwater systems. Um, so again, the detectability can be tricky sometimes with mussels, uh, and and then of course it depends a lot on the on the surveyor's skill and experience. Not only the ID, which is the, the hardest part, but sometimes the skill of finding the animal. I've had volunteers that have no previous experience, and for some reason they are great at it. And 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 and, and on the other hand, people that might have more experience have hard time finding them. So 
So stuff like that. So, and, 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 and of course the ID takes time, you know, it's taken me all these years really with the help of Matt Ashton and other experts. And I naturally, so I gotta say too, has been really helpful. Uh, and we normally deploy a small group of people to do the survey. So one day we might have uh, um, five people or and such. And actually, I, I want to give a shout out to Mary Didier, who is joining us today. She's here in the picture, measuring a muscle with a caliper, and she's joining us today. Hi, Mary. Um, oh. Yeah, <laughs> there's Mary. Hey, yeah, Mary has has been an awesome super volunteer. She has been helping us since the beginning of this effort. Uh, so, so she's uh, the most experienced uh, muscle volunteer. That's uh, great. Before you move on, Jorge, can yeah. I? Uh, we have a question. Uh, someone wants to know how long do muscles live? Great questions. Yeah, most of the the ones we're we have in the Anacostia live 30 to 40 years. The one exception is the one that I show you covered with a sponge. The Eastern Alithio is known to live up to 100 years. Wow, that surprises yeah. me for some reason. Yeah, actually, uh, bivalves, some species are known for, for uh, their longevity. For example, the uh, mercenaria, mercenaria, like the quahog that is used in the New, New, New England uh, clam chowder is known to live 400 years. It's one of the, the oldest uh, organisms. I think it's only surpassed by that the, the, the Greenland shark that lives 500 years or more. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Neat. So, Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, one of the things uh, we learn uh, is, especially in the upper Anacostia, as a see body uh, bottom low tide you're going to see the trails and then you sort of learn um, to follow those trails and grab at each end and see what it what is there or sometimes even by sight uh, you know uh, uh, normally the chinese mystery snails and, and, and introduce species in the river uh, which is very common uh, leaves these wider trails and, and they tend to be more mobile Mussels uh, uh, to leave narrower trails, and they they don't move as much. Uh, although that depends on the species and, and the time. If they are in brooding season, they might move a lot. Like this year, we found some in April, some eastern pond mussels that were really active on a spring day, and they were you could see their trails all over. And we only found them only in a place that we know there's more other species present. That day we only found pond mussels because they were in the brooding season. Um, they were waiting for fish to come by to release the larva. Uh, and these are the places along the Anacostia River where we do surveys. If you're familiar, this is the RFK Stadium, is ca East Capitol Street, Benning Road. And up here is the, the Maryland DC border. And uh, down here, uh, this is Buzzer Point very close to the, the confluence with the Potomac. And actually this is a close up to Busser Point. And this is where we have found the biggest mussel beds in the Anacostia River uh, at Busser Point. And then in second place, the, the JBAP site, that's the Bolin Air Force Base, uh, which is right across. Uh, uh, we found another really nice mussel bed. And then this spring, we found another two nice beds, but in the Potomac River, still in, in DC waters. Uh, one was uh, here, uh, uh, also at the Bowling Air Force Base, but further down in the Potomac. And then another one at the Blue Plains uh, Water Treatment Plant, right north of the effluent of the plant. And actually, I did find one mussel in the effluent in the, within the plume, which is interesting because it has a little uh, higher temperature. Not that much, but a little higher temperature. Um, so yeah, and these are our partners at the Bolin Air Force Base. They're from the like their environmental team. Normally, really excited to work on this since they normally deal with stormwater issues. So the the mussel project is their favorite. Um, so Kingman Lake, so what we found is that 
the main stem of the river when you go up uh, when you go north is not as good so buzzer point is right close to uh, the potomac river so some conditions make it really special you know water from the potomac and 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 the sheltered location of the place uh but once you go up river you know, we found that it was it was definitely poorer in terms of the Mosul community and it's you know, is uh, you would expect that with all the historic sedimentation and pollution that has been going on. But the adjacent places, the impoundments or lakes, which are not lakes per se, they are tidal impoundments. Uh, that's where the mussels were really in the upper river. So we found that these impoundments like Kingman Lake and Kenilworth Lake were sort of a mussel refugia in the Anacostia River in the upper Anacostia River. And this is Bossar Point, which is the, the hotspot. So, so far we, we have identified eight species of mussels, all native um, and uh, typically uh, typical of what you would find in the Atlantic slope, mid-Atlantic region. Um, and as you can see, uh, species with the SGCN, that means species of greatest conservation need. That means that they are listed as such as species of greatest conservation need in, in, in DC and or Maryland. So part of the work we're doing is to uh, not only increasing the biofiltration capacity of the Anacostia River, but also help with the conservation of these species. And I'll, I'll tell you uh, more about the why of that. Uh, and with the Smithsonian Natural History Museum, we also developed this poster. Uh, we currently only have it in digital due to costs, but I'm happy to, to give you a, a copy of this. So it has, uh, it's only missing actually one species. It does have some um, uh, historic species that at least in the Anacostia, we don't find anymore. One example is the green floater, which is the smallest species we have in our area. Uh, is common in other places, but in the Anacostia, not anymore due to the, the changes in the conditions. Uh, but there's actually a report, uh, there's actually a specimen at the museum that is from the 1940s from uh, near Benning Road. And then I'll actually, uh, you, you don't quite see it here, but some of these uh, and actually these actual specimens that you see on the poster, yellow lamb mussel were collected in the in the Potomac wetlands that used to be where you see the Washington Monument in DC uh, in that area when before it was developed. Uh, there were uh, some these specimens are from from that wetland. Uh, okay. I'd love to get a copy of that. I'll follow up with you later, Jorge. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great, uh, we developed it with uh, John Pfeiffer. So John is the relatively new uh, curator of bivalves at the Museum of Natural History. Um, sorry, let me drink some water. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> so uh, um, a little overview of the this group of mussels. So again, the family is called Unionids and uh, they are present all over the world. Actually, uh, there are efforts to, to restore populations in, as far as New Zealand. They call it the Kakahi there and, and in many different places. And there's also some invasive species. Uh, the, the Chinese pond mussel has been reported in New Jersey. Uh, and, uh, but all in all, there's uh, 786 uh, species that are uh, recognized uh, in the world and in the US uh, 300 species uh, so almost half of that and uh, the US is actually the hotspot of this family of mussels in the world which is very interesting you know you would think like somewhere in the Amazon or someplace like that but not really it's right here in the US and the numbers in the upper map, this one that I'm pointing with the cursor, are the number of species, total number of species per state. 
So look at um, Alabama, 175 species, Virginia, 80 species. Uh, uh, Maryland, actually, this is a little out. Uh, actually, the, the 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 number that I've heard from from the Maryland expert is 16. Um, so I don't know why it says 19. But anyways, uh, as you can see, like the Mississippi states are really uh, diverse and the southeastern states. And as, as you go north, uh, there's less, less diversity. Uh, look at California, Washington, and, and Oregon. They have four or five species in each state. Um, and, and, but the biggest thing... Uh, What's Sorry, up with that so, one species of mussel down in uh, in New Mexico? There, like, <laughs> that's pretty uh, intrepid. <laughs> oh, in New Mexico, yes, <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So the more drier areas, not very conducive to mussels. Uh, and then you can see in the lower map the percentage of those species that are in peril. So for most species in at least in the eastern half, it's you know about forty percent that are in peril. And uh, <clears throat> let me show you the next slide. Okay, that's why mussels are the most in peril group of animals, and you probably haven't heard this before, but here's a breakdown of those numbers. These are the species that are presumed or possibly extinct, critically imperiled, imperiled, or, or, or vulnerable. So look at birds and mammals, only 14 and 16% of the species are listed as such. And look at mussels, 69% of the species. And, and crayfishes are pretty high up there with 51%. And this makes sense because, you know, we have mistreated our waterways, uh, whether with the pollution, urban pollution like the Anacostia River or in places like Alabama, like unsustainable agricultural water use and such. Uh, that's why mussels are really uh, threatened in, in North America. So in, in the Anacostia River, again, we have found five, uh, sorry, eight species. And, uh, and you can see the uh, some of the, the, the number of sites where we have found them in, 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 in our surveys. Uh, and you can see the species uh, richness by site. Uh, and this is actually doesn't include data from, from last year, but Bossar Point now is up on top. We have actually found eight of the eight species at, at Bossar Point, but you can see Kenilworth Lake near Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens. If, if you're familiar with that park, uh, is high up there, uh, at least in species richness. And, and places like the ponds at Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens, and not so much uh, because of conditions of low oxygen and such. Uh, Potomac River is actually higher now after the surveys from this year, particularly, which are not included here. Uh, so Potomac is also higher now. And so being a community science or citizen science effort, uh, you know, I have a background in natural resources, but I'm not a malacologist or mollusk uh, mussel expert. So it's been a learning uh, thing for me. And, and so for the many volunteers that have helped us throughout the years. So first we started, uh, we've, we've been sort of uh, tweaking the methodology. Uh, in 2018, we started using snorkeling. And, and actually as of this year, I'm, I'm happy to say that we did our first scuba diving survey uh, in the Anacostia River. So um, as we have used different techniques, we get different results and, and we have been adjusting uh, to improve the, the methodology. Uh, so far we have found that, for example, at Kingman and Kenilworth Lake, you see species like Eastern Pond Mussel or Paper Pond Shell are the most dominant in, in terms of the number of in, individuals found. Uh, places like Bosser Point, uh, e uh, Eastern Elliptio and Northern Lands tend to be the most dominant in terms of number of, of individuals. Uh, the, uh, the, the interesting thing is that uh, Eastern Elliptio is regionally regarded as sort of the backbone species. 
uh, in many uh, rivers uh, in the in the mid Atlantic, it tends to be the dominant species as well. And and they find it a lot in archaeological site, Native American archaeological sites, because the Native Americans use them uh, mostly for the shells for different things, ornaments and, and things like that. Uh, the, again, the, the the cool thing about these surveys is that because we have been propagating the mussels since 2018, uh, we have been releasing them, and, and we normally t try to tag 10% of the mussels we release for monitoring purposes. Uh, we use uh, halprin tags, which are some small plastic uh, shellfish tags that are attached with uh, super glue. And for example, the, 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 the most recent one we found was, was encountered by a volunteer on June 16th. It was the A437. It had grown uh, one, uh, almost two inches in four years since it was last uh, measured. Uh, and before that, uh, we cultured this mussel in a floating basket at the pond uh, at Kenilworth Aquatic Garden. And, and it's interesting because at that time we didn't have a, a bubbler and we, we did face some issues with the very low dissolved oxygen in this pond because there's so much plants and organic matter that the oxygen levels drop a lot during the, the summer and early fall. So we actually had a lot of mortality at that site. And in the rest of the river, it was actually really low mortality uh, because uh, we didn't have that issue of low dissolved oxygen. Uh, so, so yeah, this mussel is, uh, is now history because it's tagged. Uh, do they, well, um, do they yeah. continue to grow through their whole lives or do they just grow for a short period of time? Yeah, I think, yeah, what we have noticed, so during uh, when we um, grow them in floating basket is during the first years, they might be like, one, uh, two years old when we grow them in baskets and cages for, for about one year. And, and we have found that they tend to grow about an inch per year, depend, give or take, depending on the species, uh, about an inch per year. But once they grow more like this specimen, uh, it looks like the grow, growth may plateau at some point. And, and mussels are like that. It's not like uh, fish or reptiles that they just keep growing and growing. And you can find them every now and then an unusually huge individual. That, uh, that I believe that's not the case for, for mussels. They, they do reach a, a limit. And one, one basic thing uh, is that they are reproducing. Uh, it might sound very obvious and basic. But the fact that we're finding these uh, gravid females, that we're doing all this propagation and, and that we find juveniles during our surveys is encouraging, uh, especially if you look at the hundreds of years of river pollution and neglect. Uh, and river is improving, but still uh, in places like Oregon and the, the Willamette uh, River or Willamette uh, River in Oregon, uh, there's a nice looking mussel bed, but they are not reproducing for some reason. They are st still trying to pin down what's the reason. They think it's a mix of the host fish availability, climate change and, and whatnot. But, uh, you know, it, it looks like the species we have in the Anacostia are resilient. And that's 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 a good thing. So we started the, the restoration effort in in 2018, uh, growing mussels in floating baskets. Uh, again, mussels produced at the hatchery in, in Virginia. And basically we were monitoring growth, survival, site suitability, and you know, to help with the conservation of these species. We are doing some things that we're still, the results are pending from different sources. Tissue analysis, well, they, we have those, the tissue analysis, but we, we, we're working with experts to help us um, uh, make sense and assimilate this data, but we have uh, data on nutrients that are uh, in the muscle tissues, the soft tissues and the shell. And our idea with that is to make muscles a BMP, a best management practice, a certified 
best management practice for the Chesapeake Bay watershed, just like oysters are. Uh, and then also we have given samples to University of Maryland and, and Tetra Tech, which is a big environmental firm to do microplastics analysis. And, uh, and just the, the main goal is the more mussels, more biofiltration and better for, for the river. And so again, this was the first phase 2018 to 2019, our very first batch. And actually, you can see Mary Didier again here in the photo. <laughs> uh, these were our uh, seven original sites uh, along the river. And um, uh, well, the first it started, you know, we have to start from scratch. So first, uh, we have to collect the brood stock. What is that? So we basically went to the river snorkeling, and that's myself, <laughs> and, and with the help of volunteers like Mary and others with Aquascope, uh, we went in the early spring, collected mussels, and with, with the um, sort of uh, makeshift uh, uh, speculums, uh, we uh, checked the mussels for gravidity. Basically, you carefully pry them open like less than a fourth of an inch and check for the gills. So in this example, this is an LY floater. See how swollen the, the gills look. Or in this case, an Eastern lamb mussel, you can see like the rib surface of the, of the swollen gills. When they are not gravid or when they are male, the, the gills look just flat and saggy. <clears throat> and then, uh, so after that, we send the, the gravid females to the hatchery and they do the rest. Uh, the Harrison Lake uh, National Fish Hatchery, they use different aquaculture, in some case, complex aquaculture uh, settings to first do the uh, fish infestation process, then collect the tiny mussels that come out of the fish body and then in different stages, grow them to different sizes. And the, the last stage being a, the pond or feeding them with pond water. Uh, and that's when they grow really fast. In this case, this was a, a, an LY floater, one of our first uh, gravid females. And then the, we, we returned these females. Unfortunately, there's mortality in some cases, but only a minority. Uh, uh, but but oftentimes or normally the case is that we return these females into the river and tag them so that we don't work with them again to not overwork them uh, because that the process is taxing for these animals. Uh, just the, the whole process of reproducing as many organisms is it's a lot of energy and effort uh, and, and expend. Uh, and, and these are uh, some of the babies from this female and other females after three or four months. And again, this has been possible only with the help of, of volunteers like Mary and many other volunteers uh, uh, like Laura known from Friends of Kingman and Heritage Island and other folks from that organization, master naturalists, or just the independent or volunteers that come from corporate groups. In, in the, this case, in the picture is FedEx, which actually was one of the, the donors uh, uh, of, of this muscle project. Uh, second phase, uh, 2019 to present. So we're continuing our surveys that we started in 2017 and we're growing muscles in other systems that we have developed in partnership with the hatchery including these uh, bottom cages or riverbed cages, which are cinder blocks. And then inside the cinder block uh, structure, there's a, a, a cage made out of crap uh, mesh, crap, crap, crap cage mesh. And then it has a lead made out of rebar and the same crap cage mesh. Um, and mussels are completely enclosed. Well, this is sort of the second iteration. The first one, they were just corralled, but but guess what? They started escaping out of the cage through the cracks of the cinder blocks. So we had to uh, make a, an enhanced version where the muscles are completely enclosed and that's working much better. Um, so far, we 
we have been working with five different species of mussels, LY floater, Eastern lamb mussel, Eastern pond mussel, Eastern floater, uh, and the most recent is the Eastern elitio, the one that, that I mentioned that lives up to 100 years. This is a, a, a rather complicated species, the most complicated to, to propagate for a variety of reasons. Uh, and to the point that these mussels that this first batch that we've got, uh, they were propagated in vitro uh, because in the mussel world, they are starting uh, to use in vitro for some species that are hard to propagate like this um, to forego the host fish. Uh, and also the, in one of the host fish of Eastern Elliptios is the American eel. And American eels, <laughs> excuse me, are notoriously famous for escaping out of tanks and they are super hard to keep in captivity. So um, that's why they are using in vitro to forego the host fish and, 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 and make it doable. But at the same time, it's of course more costly and more difficult. Actually, Mary and I and Laura and other volunteer were monitoring these mussels and the, I was a little anxious about that because these bottom cages, they grow more, but there's more mortality. But guess what? We didn't see a single dead mussel today of this. And these pictures are from today, from this cage where we have our um, uh, 300 uh, Eastern Elliptius. So that was uh, awesome to see that. <clears throat> but again, in general, they have grown about uh, an inch, in some cases more like the LY floater, uh, two inches in one year. And you can see mussels in this picture on top, Eastern Pond mussel and below LY floater. And uh, excuse me, you, you can see them <clears throat> beside a quarter dollar. Uh, and then a year later on the right. See how they darken in color? And in the case of the pond mussel, when they are young, they have those beautiful like green rays. As they age, they, they tend to become darker because of the microhabitat and such. <clears throat> so, so again, this is the growth we have observed. Uh, again, you can see if we're some species, you know, one inch, uh, other floater, the eastern pond mussel a little less than an inch and uh, and less for others. Uh, LY floaters tend to be the, the fastest growing species. And in this case, it's pretty cool. You can see this individual. So they grow outward. So all this green hue color area is the growth they, they, they reach in, in a year, in, in a growing season. Uh, um, and, and normally when you see rings, marked rings like this one, that's, that means the, the end of a growing season, start of winter. So normally, let us say we get this mussel the size of, of, of this, where the first growth ring, the major growth ring is. And then the green area is the new growth of the mussel. <clears throat> so far we have, uh, released over 36,000 mussels of four species. Again, the fifth species, the Eastern Elliptia, we have not released it yet. It's still being culture in a cage. Uh, but uh, of the other four species, we have released over 36,000 uh, mussels, which when you do the math at 10, at, at least at 10 gallons of water in a, in a day, sorry, and, and then in a year, that's about 200, Olympic sized swimming pools of water being filtered by these animals. We normally release the mussels uh, by hand. That's pretty much, we chuck them like little rocks because by then they're, they are, you know, an inch or so big. They're pretty strong. They're, their shell is calcium carbonate. So they're pretty strong animals. So you just have to chuck them. You can place them in the substrate but it's not necessary, especially for the Anacostia that is mostly soft bottom. And we might do it wading or by canoe. Uh, one thing that has been very critical is the education. 
because people think we have oysters in the Anacostia River, but we don't have oysters because again, the Anacostia River is a freshwater system. So we're sort of educating people from that point that we have mussels and we have more than one. Oysters is just one species, mussels we have eight. And uh, so there's a great potential and we have, uh, that's why we created the Mussel Power Education Program. It was modeled after a similar program in, in the state of Ohio called uh, Muscles in the Classroom. So it has uh, three parts, uh, including classroom and field experiences, and the kids get to grow the mussels in a fish tank in the classroom. We give them the, the plankton cocktail. They feed the mussels uh, for a couple of months, and then they get to put them in the baskets of our, our culture in areas. And then they go on a boat tour and such. Uh, so we've been working with a lot of schools in DC, uh, Montgomery County, but in the last year we've been focusing with Prince George's County. And uh, this year we work with a lot of uh, uh, at all levels, pretty much from kindergarten to high school, but a, a lot of uh, high school students as well this this past uh, season. Uh, we're going to start the next cohort uh, next month, actually, and uh, that's why this week we were tagging 2,000 muscles that will be going into the classrooms. <clears throat> um, so, so yeah, and they, they do different, depending on the school and such, it integrates with different uh, with math, with arts, and you can do water quality testing, data collection, particularly for the high school students, or they might learn about anatomy and physiology using clay, uh, and then the, the field trips in the, to, to the Anacostia River. And yeah, some, some cool artwork has come out of it. And uh, we do, a, actually we do a contest, uh, an art contest. And this is one of my favorites right here. So a fish is like a daycare for Glochidia. Glopedia is the larva and see how uh, by Connor see how he he painted the the little threads of uh, of larva in the as the mussel gills uh, uh, sorry as the fish gills and the larva attached to them this is part of the high school uh, mussel comics as part of the the, the program we have uh, they, they get an award the best one and such so they tell a lot of these cool stories uh, using art and based on the muscle biology. And that's uh, Kendra Bierman on the left, our director of education program with some teachers. Uh, okay, so what's the future? So we basically have done a, uh, a preliminary analysis and we have found uh, identified an area of about uh, um, um, 600 acres of riverbed that is between uh, 13, 14 feet and shallower. So that's the area where you will find most mussels. Once you go deeper than that, 14, you still find mussels, but way less. Why is that? Due to natural low oxygen levels in deep river sites. So that's why mo most mussels are in the shallower areas. So when we map that area, again, we, we came up with the 600 acre area. And so the general estimate is that we could uh, propagate as much as 400,000 mussels there um, based on the densities we have observed at Bosser Point, which is a the river mussel hotspot where, where uh, which is like a, the best example of a mussel bed how the mussels uh, the, the mussel beds were in the Anacostia river uh, but again this is dependent on many things it's not that we can go out and throw 400,000 mussels that's a multi-year project <clears throat> and we, al we also have to do site assessment because it doesn't mean that all those 600 acres are good there are some areas that are no good because of the substrate. The sediment might be too anoxic, uh, too crappy. So different factors at play. This is just 
uh, as a, a matter of a, an exercise to sort of setting up a goal for the future. Um, and then another thing that we have been brainstorming recently is this. Uh, how to create, uh, can we create a, an urban muscle riverbed area? Because Bosser Point and the Lower Anacostia River uh, below the Frederick Douglass Bridge, it seems to be a great high quality mussel habitat according to our work. And how far those do, 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 do these areas extend into the Potomac River? Well, uh, at least we have found a couple of great sites in the Potomac, uh, JVAP and uh, Blue Plains. So we might be uh, against uh, significant uh, area of high quality mussel habitat. So what, what does this mean in, in terms of a protected area? We don't quite know yet, uh, but since it's such an important high quality habitat, we wanna somehow protect it for future generations because you know it's like wetlands. <clears throat> it's not the same, uh, you know, full grown natural wetland versus a restored wetland. Restored wetlands are awesome, but it's not going to give the same ecosystem services as the old wetland. And that's what's going on here. We have a, a, a mussel beds made up of old mussels and young mussels and healthy uh, mussel bed, which is providing all that biofiltration and all those biodiversity ecosystem services there. <clears throat> So yeah, that's pretty much all. So follow us at anacostiaws.org or on social media at anacostiaws. We have a hashtag muscle power and we have different volunteer opportunities. Again, muscle surveys, muscle monitoring, release events, cage maintenance, among other. Uh, so we hope to see you in the field. Um, and I guess, uh, yeah. I'm open uh, to questions, uh, more questions now. A few more questions in the chat here. Um, I'll just read them all. Uh, would one expect to find these same species in other nearby rivers, Susquehanna, Delaware, et cetera? Anyone researching them? Or are the populations pretty specific to where they're actually found? And then a, another question, uh, can you talk about specific challenges, diseases, parasite problems for these groups of mussels effect of pollution? Yeah, so uh, basically you're gonna find similar communities as long as you are in the region, sort of the mid-Atlantic uh, drainages, and you're probably gonna find very similar communities in the tight water. Now, once you start moving into non-tidal, you might find other uh, species. Um, or if you go uh, west in areas, of course, that drain out, that do not drain into the Atlantic Ocean, you might find that, that are, for example, in the Mississippi drainage, then you might start finding other set of species. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, but yeah, for Susquehanna and Delaware, it's going to be pretty similar, I would say. And also, are there disease parasite problems? Okay, this is a great question. So, well, effect of pollution. So we know the species we have are tough and resilient because they have survived all these centuries of pollution and such. Um, and regarding diseases, we haven't, uh, there's not a lot known according to my conversation with experts in the field. That's something that uh, they are trying to, to inquire scientifically more about. Uh, you might have heard uh, of the pheasant shell mussel from the Clinch River in Tennessee and Virginia. There was a, a high mortality event there and it looks like the culprit might be a virus that also affects uh, uh, organisms like uh, starfish and other critters like that. Um, <clears throat> but they are not 100% sure yet. So in general, this, there's not a lot known about uh, uh, diseases that affect the mussels. 
and, um, and for example, a, a preliminary study, not with the mussels, but in the water column uh, in the Anacostia River by the Gallaudet University, they did find a virus that is similar to the one that is affecting the, the mussels in the Clinch River. Uh, <clears throat> but it's, again, it's still soon to to make conclusions. Uh, it might be the case that the virus has been around and the mussels being in these tight waters and polluted tight waters are already used to it, question mark. We don't know if that's the case or not because the, the pheasant shell case in the Clinch River, we're talking about a very pristine kind of mountain valley uh, area where mussels are more sensitive than in a, you know, tight water with you know, history of pollution like the Anacostia River. But yeah, to, uh, the short answer is that, yeah, not much is known about what affect these, these mussels. That's why <clears throat> more and more we find, um, um, we find us doing more uh, uh, measures to prevent the spread of diseases, for example, like by quarantining mussels that come from a hatchery, uh, keep them in a pond for a month at least, and, uh, and not release them straight into the river. There's things like that, but I think that those are things that the the mussel community, if you will, are still sort of learning because this is a relatively new thing. Mussel propagation has only developed in the last decade. Uh, so far, it was mostly uh, universities or, or government agencies doing doing it. So that's why. We're excited to to be one of the first small nonprofits doing it. I love it, and I love that you're getting the the next generation involved with all of your outreach at schools and everything. That's so cool. I look forward to uh, following this. This is really this is fascinating and important. Other questions? Yeah, we've seen a lot of uh, enthusiasm. We we never saw mussels as a charismatic species but it turns out they they might be <laughs> people uh we were seeing new volunteers we have a, a volunteer uh, mailing list and we have over 200 people just for muscle events we have new members donors and, and just we see a lot of interest in muscles which is quite interesting that's awesome thank you so much Appreciate your time. Uh, any other questions, folks? Are we all good? All right, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much, Jorge, I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for having me and thank you.